around. I got to be out, and it's outdoor stuff. I'm not much for going to a gym to work out. My physical exercise, I have to be outdoors doing it. For Point Hatfield, the mountains and rivers of Montana have always been a certain kind of therapy. Running and river guiding in the summer and teaching backcountry skiing in the winter have helped him through life's many difficulties. But the greatest challenge of his life took the outdoors away from him. It was like two days after New Year's. It just dumped two feet of snow. And a group of us skied from Mammoth down to Gardner after work. And we went out for dinner. And when we were sitting, having dinner, I just went like this and, hmm, there's a lump there. I had a radical neck dissectomy. So they cut out this side of my neck. They took out the cladiosternomastis muscle and all the lymph nodes. But the cancer so, came back. Two more tumors and another surgery later, it was clear Hatfield would have to endure chemotherapy and radiation. Chemo and radiation were horrible, literally horrible, because I was throwing up almost all day long, every day. I zapped every ounce of life I had in me, just about. I was just hanging on by a thread. Just like he used to, Hatfield turned to the outdoors for comfort, trying to ski a small hill in his backyard. So I got two runs of two turns in, and then that's all I could do, wipe me out. Two days after that, I went cross-country skiing with my wife, and I was able to do about a mile. That's all I could do. I was exhausted. Then after the third round of treatment, I couldn't do anything. Hatfield's athletic frame melted from 160 pounds of muscle to barely 124 pounds. I used to have 15 inch arms, biceps. They went down to 9 inches. I used to have thick legs. I'm skinny now. I'm not used to being skinny. Are there things that you know that kind of trigger um, your nausea and things like that? No, it just comes. Just, just like that, it just comes. And we've used the other anti-nausea medications with you. I was on Ativan. Mm -hmm. I was on Zoloft. I think Zofran too. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple of steroids that I wore a patch with. I think there was a couple of other drugs too that they tried. Dr. Jack Hensold is Hatfield's oncologist. He says these are common anti-nausea medications that work for most patients. We have very good anti-nausea medications now, and, and you know, I make a little bit of an advertisement for that right now. People don't get sick on chemotherapy as they used to because the standard anti-nausea medications are so good. But Point Hatfield wasn't one of those patients. They just did not work. Not at all? Not at all. Didn't alleviate anything. So what was the next step? Well then, Dr. Hensel asked me if I would be willing to try medical marijuana. I said, I'll try anything. We've had patients who've tolerated very well and it's done some really good things for them. Even though Hatfield had his doctor's blessing, he still needed the green light from Wendy Gwenner, the hospital's oncology social worker. We had a fair number of patients who came out of the woodwork who um, probably were users anyway and said, well gosh, I've got cancer. Um, can I get a card? And the answer is no, you can't. Gwenner carefully evaluated Hatfield's case, just like she does with every patient, before signing off on the medical marijuana recommendation. We have to be screening you and making sure that we've used appropriate medications as first-line treatment if our anti-emetic med medicines have not worked well um, and we've gone through our cadre of um, medicines, then we would go to medical marijuana. After I got the medical marijuana, it just alleviated so much of that sick, pukey feeling and alleviated the throwing up. Immediately? Immediately. Wow. Immediately. It's like it was a godsend. It was a wonderful thing. Because that throwing up all the time is not good. Right, right. I believe that the medical marijuana saved my life. I couldn't eat anything, couldn't swallow, 
and I think it just saved, I just think it saved my life. Five years after he was first diagnosed, Hatfield is cancer free and enjoying Montana's beauty again. Nowadays, he says the beauty isn't the only thing he loves about this state. He loves the progressive voters who passed the state's compassionate use medical marijuana law in 2004, allowing patients like him the option of using a drug at the center of a growing controversy. There's a false stigma attached to it, and I'm doing this interview to help other people. Why not? It's our job to help other people. It's our responsibility. If we can do something for people, why not do it? If something can help somebody, why not let those people have that? Impassioned pleas from patients just like Hatfield have been the spark behind a nationwide movement to allow access to marijuana as a medicine. By the fall of 2010, 15 states had passed laws similar to Montana's. This is all in direct conflict with federal law. Since the 1970s, the U.S. government has considered marijuana a dangerous drug, one with a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. It's known as a Schedule I drug, the most restricted category. Marijuana shares its Schedule I status with drugs like heroin, ecstasy, and LSD. Drugs that have a high potential for abuse but do have an accepted medical value are placed on Schedule II. Some of the drugs currently on Schedule II are methamphetamine, cocaine, opium, and morphine. Doctors can legally prescribe medications on Schedule II. They cannot prescribe Schedule I drugs. So doctors like Hensold cannot legally prescribe marijuana to patients like Hatfield. Instead, state marijuana initiatives carve out a gray area, allowing doctors to make a recommendation for medical use. But they do so at their own peril, since the federal government still views any marijuana use, even medical, as illegal. The government publicly says, Marijuana's not a medicine because we don't have enough studies to show it, or we don't have this, or we don't have that. And you go, well, here I am. You've been sending me this for 28 years. Every month, Florida stockbroker Urban Rosenfeld receives a tin of 300 federally grown and rolled marijuana cigarettes, complete with a legal marijuana prescription glued to the side. Does it seem hypocritical to you? Of course it's hypocritical. Of course it is. I mean, the fact that they've been giving it to me for all this time, they've given me over 120,000 medical marijuana cigarettes so far in my lifetime. In the 28 years, 120,000. Rosenfeld is one of four surviving public patients in a little-known federal program. I show my tin can, I show my marijuana, they go, what? What do you mean the federal government grows this? What do you mean the federal government supplies this? They have no idea. It was called the Federal Investigational New Drug Program. Since applications to the program are confidential, the exact number of patients who made it in is unknown. Rosenfeld believes he was one of about a dozen patients who received legal marijuana cigarettes from the federal government. We were able to convince the government that nothing else worked, and so they had no choice but to give it to us. Rosenfeld argued he needed marijuana to treat his terrible pain caused by a rare disorder diagnosed at age 10. It's called multiple congenital cartilaginous exostosis and a, which is, means bone tumors on the end of long bones, that whatever tumors I had at puberty will grow as I grow. They mostly grow outwardly into the muscles in the veins, stretching the muscles in the veins, making it very painful and very tender. I'd be screaming and, and crawling on the floor for two hours, trying to get the muscles to get back in place. And then once they finally got back in place, the, two, the muscles would be so torn that I couldn't walk for three days. On top of the pain was the knowledge that any of the hundreds of benign tumors in his body could become malignant at any time. Rosenfeld spent his youth and teen years on synthetic morphine, muscle relaxants, and sleeping pills. By age 20, he was taking more than 200 pills a month, and he was a vocal critic of illegal drugs. I hear kids talk about drugs and things like that, and I go, why are you doing drugs? I mean, look at all I have to do. You'd be thankful you're healthy. Even so, Rosenfeld finally gave in to peer pressure and tried marijuana in college. He says he didn't feel anything and decided the drug was useless and that his friends were just imagining they were high. But a strange thing happened one night while smoking marijuana and playing chess with a friend. Rosenfeld did something he hadn't done in years. He sat comfortably for 30 full minutes. I thought, well, wait a minute, in what way did I take all the narcotics and drugs I had to allow me to sit? And I thought, gee, I haven't taken a pill in six hours. Well, then how can I sit? And just then, there was my turn with the joint. They handed me the joint. I looked at this piece of garbage, because to me, it's all it was. 
I said, this is the only thing I've done differently. I've smoked this garbage. I wonder if there's any medical benefit to this garbage. Rosenfeld had stumbled onto another potential medical use for cannabis, chronic pain. When he joined the federal program in the 80s, he became one of a rare group of medical marijuana patients, patients who could speak openly without fear of arrest about its medical benefits. Their stories added some legitimacy to an expanding body of anecdotal evidence. Medical marijuana has grown to a point where the government looks foolish saying it's not a medicine. It is a medicine. 82-year-old retired Harvard professor Dr. Lester Grinspoon is well-versed in the anecdotal evidence surrounding medical marijuana. He's told Urban Rosenfeld's story along with many other patient stories in his book Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine. His opinion of cannabis has come a long way since he first began investigating it as a young assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard in the late 60s. Back then, he certainly did not see it as a medicine. Uh, Back then, he certainly did not see it as a medicine. I uh, could only see from my ivory tower that lots of people were using marijuana. I had uh, a concern that uh, marijuana was a terribly dangerous, I believed it, a terribly dangerous drug. And why wouldn't he? The 1930s era film Reefer Madness was a dramatic manifestation of government and media claims about the dangers of marijuana. The film portrays marijuana smokers as delirious, insane, even homicidal. Dr. Grinspoon was gravely concerned, and he wanted to give young students the proof that marijuana was hurting them. I went into the library and started to look at this. I wanted to provide a scientific and medical basis for the prohibition. What, what was the government standing on and saying that this was uh, a dangerous drug? Psychotic reactions can happen. Marijuana is now known to initiate depressive episodes, um, delusional episodes, manic episodes, and even psychotic episodes. Dr. Eric Voth is an internal medicine physician and an addiction and pain specialist in Topeka, Kansas. He's also the chairman of the Institute on Global Drug Policy and has advised former presidents Reagan, Bush Sr., Bush Jr., and Clinton on drug policy. A critic of medical marijuana, he says one of his biggest concerns is the risk of mental illness, especially schizophrenia. But there are clearly patients where it kind of uncaps the psychosis. Schizophrenia is a, is a form of a psychotic illness, and uh, uncapping it in people who didn't know they had it, uh, there have been episodes, again, of people who have, have sort of uncapped and continued schizophrenic that did not have it ahead of time. Indeed, research has shown a connection between marijuana use and schizophrenia. There is also great concern over marijuana use in teens and young adults because their brains are still developing. But it's still unclear whether marijuana causes mental illness or someone with a mental illness is more likely to use marijuana. As a psychiatrist, Dr. Grinspoon's expertise was in schizophrenia, and he strongly disagrees with critics who say marijuana may trigger the disease. I think that is absurd. If you just take the fact that schizophrenia, the frequency of schizophrenia is about 1% the world around. Now, you would expect with a drug that's used as often as it is, you would expect that this, there'd be a little bleep in this. It, do, it doesn't change a bit. It hasn't changed. I, in fact, you can find as much literature about how cannabis is useful to schizophrenic patients as it's harmful. Dr. Grinspoon could not find evidence to back up the government and media reports that marijuana use leads to drug-induced violence. <laughs> An incurable insanity. He is hopelessly and incurably insane, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. This substance, the most harmful thing about it, was not any inherent psychopharmacological property of the drug, but rather the way we as a society were treating uh, the people who use this drug. It's been a medicine for about 3,000 years now.